Okay, well, welcome to today's um, interview. We're here with David Novak and George Sabados, and um, we're going to be talking about what David's got to share with us, um, particularly where we're looking to see how we can connect communities with good financial advice, David, and how we can make a difference for them. And we're also talking to a lot of real estate agents in our audience, so real estate agents and their clients as well. Um, and what's ironic is a lot of real estate agents don't often have a lot of good financial sense about them. They're really good at selling properties and making money that way. But when it comes to growing their wealth and building wealth, um, a lot of them, unfortunately, just don't seem to really set themselves up and don't have that, that mindset. So um, today we're going to we'll discover a lot more about what David does and how he teaches yep. people. Um, yep. um, maybe you can share a little bit more about that, David. Yeah, um, should I give a bit of background? Um, my yes. background? Can I yeah, can I just right. can I just preface uh, what you're going to say uh, uh, by 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 encouraging our listeners to listen to you to the very end of this this podcast because you are an incredible um, uh, performer in in the space that you're in and and you've you've uh, given incredible advice and made many many appearances um, on TV and and on the world stage so. It, it, uh, it, I would encourage everyone to listen to you all the way to the end. So now go ahead, David. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. And, and thank you, Barry, for that introduction. Look, yeah, just briefly, look, without going into my whole life history, um, I was a financial controller back in the 80s. I was the chief accountant at Barclays Bank. Um, what Robert Kiyosaki loved about my story when I was a keynote speaker for Robert Kiyosaki is the author of the best-selling financial book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, who sold 30 million copies around the world, is on Oprah, it's on the best New York, you know, Wall Street bestsellers list for 12 years. Uh, what Robert loved about my story was that I was a high school dropout at 15 and became the chief account of Barclays at 25. So I reached the pinnacle of success in my career. I was financially independent in my late 20s. I owned my own property. Um, I moved to Perth and, and had everything going and, and I was bored. And I went to the stock market. I got this hot tip to buy a gold stock, I never forget the name of it, called Buddha Gold, and um, doubled my money and thought, how easy is this? And got excited about the market, like everybody's excited about the stock market today. It just went up and up and up until that fateful day, 1987, 19th of October to be precise, when the market crashed. And I lost everything. I went, I, I got wiped out in one day. That was the biggest lesson I ever learned. And then um, you both know that I did a very powerful transformational program called the Landmark Forum, which completely altered my view of myself and life and what's possible. So I went from being a shy introvert accountant to, if you told me, I was going to start teaching people about the financial markets and start with teaching small groups of 20, 30 people. And then one day I just get a call out of the blue from um, the promoters of Tony Robbins, the first program coming to Sydney in 98. Uh, which is the four-day wealth mastery program at Star City, and they rang, phoned me up out of the blue. I don't know how they found out about me, but they wanted to ask me if I'd come and be a, a guest speaker in derivatives, which is my expertise, not just stocks, but derivatives known as options. So I did, and um, that was my breakthrough moment in front of more than a thousand people. I think it was about fifteen hundred, and then I, they invited me to come back and be a keynote speaker the following year and the year after for Tony and in Singapore, and then Robert came to Sydney in 2000. I get, I mean, his three-day financial intelligence program with a thousand people, and I get a tap on the shoulder, and that's turn around to Robert Kiyosaki and introducing himself and asking me to speak, and I thought, like, this can't be happening. Anyway, wow. cut a long story short, he then uh, invites me to the States and be a keynote speaker for him around the world, which I did in front of 100,000 people in 16 different countries. So. Uh, then I got asked to be on Sky Business News, for which I was on a number of programs. One of the most popular ones called Your Money, Your Call. It's a live interactive show. 250,000 people, I think, watch that. Brokers, every broker, advisor, uh, sophisticated investor in Australia watch Sky Business as for Your Money, Your Call. And um, had a lot of fun on the show for 10 years. And then just yesterday, I was on the new, uh, it's replaced Sky Business channel which is called Ausbiz with David Koch, Koch David Koch or Koshy, you know, right. he's a very well-known personality. And I'm on tomorrow on another one called Ticket TV. And so it's a pleasure to be here and share wow. my knowledge. Well, in that, in that time, uh, David, you certainly come out of your shell and you're showing a bit of personality, which is great for, for <laughs> someone who started off as a shy accountant. Yeah. Thanks, to landmark, <laughs> thanks to Landmark Education. That's terrific, terrific. And you're on an Aus. 
Aussie show, which is great. It's uh, yes. an Aussie network. Terrific. Uh, uh, as you notice, Barry has his own Aussie network, Osway. <laughs> We've got a network of real estate agents <laughs> on the Osway Realty Network. <laughs> <laughs> so we're pushing the Aussie theme. That's terrific. Uh, you should start, it. start your own little studio. There, there you go. There's an idea. We, we're getting there. We're getting there. But yeah. David, David, one of the one of the things that uh, you know, those you learnt, you learnt a valuable lesson by losing everything. Yes. Um, what were some of the key elements that the, the takeaways that you took from that experience? Number of things. The uh, first thing is, I vowed that I would learn everything I could about the financial markets and what's really going on, so I wasn't, I wouldn't be blindsided again. And that's been my passion for thirty years. So I did, I could see the dot com mania happening. I saw the GFC coming, well before it happened. Um, actually, two years before. You know, I didn't know exactly when it was going to happen, but I knew it was going to happen. And uh, it's pretty obvious to me. You know, things are pretty simple, really. They're not complicated. I'm not an economist, but I think I see things simply. I just see, well, as Landmark calls it, the what so or the reality of what's going on. So just, you know, being an accountant, you know, one and one didn't equal two when I was looking at property prices and stocks going up before the GFC. What did make sense was when the US Federal Reserve cut interest rates aggressively in two, after the dot-com mania crash, though, they were fearful of the economy going into a recession. So the action they took, which is the biggest mistake they made, is they cut interest rates aggressively for 18 months from 2000 to 2001, from 6.5% to 1%. That caused a borrowing binge. People went out and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed money. And then we had the subprime crisis in the US, which was when Lehman Brothers and financial institutions like that were lending money to people uh, with mortgage-backed, they call it mortgage-backed securities. And uh, these people had no job or no income. They're called ninja loans, but they're called collateralized debt obligation securities as a fancy name. But really, it's subprime, as you better known. And there's a, there's a great series on it called The Big Short. Yeah, the guy yeah. made a fortune out of it. He could see it coming. So I could see this was a bubble. Um, because, look, when you've got asset prices going up, regardless whether it's bonds, whether it's real estate or stocks. And, you know, if you looked at it, it, what was also equally going up around the world was debt. So when you've got prices doubling and tripling, I mean, you know, you look at wages and inflation has been going down and interest rates have been going down for the last 30 years. I mean, this is what they call the longest uh, bull market in what they call bonds in history. Now, when just uh, not going too, too technical, but when the bond market is how the government raises money, you know, long-term bonds. So in, here in Australia, there's 10-year treasury, 10-year bonds, and in the US, there's 30, 10-year and 30-year treasury bonds. Well, 30-year treasury bonds have been going up for more than 30 years. And therefore, when they go up, the interest rates go down. So it's been fantastic for our banks, you know, lending money. It's Nirvana. I mean, I was in banking for 12 years. Mm. How do banks make money? Easy. Make sure you, um, you know, lend a lot of money and don't have any bad debts. And that's what it's been like for 30 years. We haven't had a recession. Mm. Yeah. Well, that would be the reason why the real estate market has just gone like this pretty much the whole last 30 years. Exactly. That, that, that's exactly right. Um, so that's what's been, you know, here's the other, stati- I'm into statistics and facts. You know, if you look at our four banks, you know, NAB, CBA is the biggest, Westpac and, and ANZ, of course. They're the biggest banks in the world. They're in the top 20. In fact, CBA, people don't realize, is the largest retail bank in the world. Wow. If you combine all the population of Germany, for example, which is the biggest economy in Europe, and there's 80 million people, and combine all their banks, CBA is worth more. That's how, much we're, that's how much we're leveraged to really. So investors who bought into bank shares, like if you bought CBA in 1992-93 at 4 or $5, it went up to $93. Wow. And the dividend wow. yield is $4, $4, $4 every year, fully frank. So you're getting an 80% return on your money just on dividends after tax. Fantastic investment. Not now. 
I mean, you know, now I wouldn't touch the banks. You know, they suspended the dividends because of the COVID situation, but there's many other reasons. So basically, if you look at the world, what's happened in the last three decades, the world has grown massively on the back of debt and money printing by central banks. And interest rates being zero, and in fact, in other places in Europe, it's negative. If you want to lend money to the German government, you have to pay them half percent interest. Wow. Wow. So it's not worth leaving your money in the oh, bank. If oh, you've got more than 50,000 euros in the bank, you've got to pay the bank. I mean, this wow. is insane as a result of all the money printing. And they had to do it because they had to uh, save the financial system because of that collapse of what happened since the GFC. The problem now we have is that the debt has escalated, particularly in the US before the national debt before the GFC in the, in the US was seven trillion. Now, just to put that in perspective, one trillion, one, one thousand million dollars is one billion. One thousand billion is one trillion. Wow. That's a lot of money. So that was That's seven trillion money. before the GFC. Now the US just hit a new record of 26 trillion. Whoa, that's phenomenal, isn't it? And where's yeah. this money coming from? Well, right Aren't now... Aren't they just printing more, printing more money? Yeah, the, the Federal Reserve just printed about another three or four trillion since the COVID. Uh, and what they're doing is they print this money from nothing. They lend it to the US government treasury and the US government treasury then lend it to the government. Well, uh, hang on, that, that's the same way the... The Federal Reserve works here, right? It's a closed not, loop. It's a loop. No, we, we haven't got into money printing here. Japan has uh, enormously. Japan's been printing crazily since Shinzo Abe came into power at the end of 2012. They're printing about 80 trillion yen every year massively. Then uh, you've got Europe, the ECB. But how does that help them? Well, how does it help? It is they, it's, they try to stimulate the economy because... The theory of quantitative easy, and I've got a graph on this, but I can't show I don't have it with me. But here's the theory, is that the central bank prints money and lends it to financial institutions, banks, cuts interest rates to zero. The yes. theory is then the banks lend money to you, us, the individual, to go and spend, borrow more, spend and invest. Yeah. And that stimulates the economy and creates employment. Now, it has created employment. In fact, if you look at the US, it's the lowest unemployment rate in history, but the lowest interest rates in history because it's zero. However, this is, the, this is what's confounded the economists out there. You can ask any economist is, usually when you increase the money supply, there's inflation, there's interest, interest rates go up. That hasn't been happening. So why not? Well, you should ask an economist that. I've yeah. asked several. <laughs> yes, none, of them have it out. No, none of them have a clearly defined answer, but here's my response. Why, why not? The world has been buying goods and goods from China. Deflation. Correct. So, so when you're buying goods from a country that produces it much cheaper than you can produce it here, that's going to lower costs. Right. But it also takes away jobs from other places as well. Yeah. But it keeps costs down. So what is Trump trying to do is reverse that to create jobs in America and, you know, growth in America rather than running what they call the current account deficit where they're importing more than they're exporting. That's what he's trying to do. Now, a bit late, you know, yeah. late at the party. He saw this 20... Look, I'll take my hat off to him. He saw that 20 years ago, you know. He did see this problem and the US didn't address it. But look, if, if we start putting tariffs on imported Chinese goods, inflation's gonna go up, yep. so, are interest, so are interest rates. Yep. That's gonna create a problem in its own right. So see, David, sorry, David, I just, I, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like what? what um, well, that's right, you're, you're stuck. Um, you know, look, this is the thing, when you've got policymakers who are academics they don't deal with the real world no they're not they're not uh you know they 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 just operate from crisis to crisis 
and they don't think about the implications of it. And look, I, I study the smartest, wealthiest people in the world. You know, Stanley Jockermiller is one of the legends in the hedge, hedge fund industry. Howard Marks is another one. Oak Tree Capital. I mean, Warren Buffett, everybody's heard about, right? But, you know, they, these are very smart people. And, you know, I read what their comments are. And so right now, there's two, two theories out there. We're either going to have deflation happening from here on because we've got an asset bubble like Japan did in the late 80s and stocks and property went down by 80% on zero interest rates. That's why they're pretty wow. they, Central banks want to create inflation to inflate assets, mm -hmm. but it's not working. You know, because if you start lifting wages, who are you going to export to? Mm. It's going to lift interest rates. So, you know, so if you go to Japan, if you speak to a Japanese who went through that bubble and say, listen, I'll give you 100 million yen, squealing, you know, he'll run for the hills at zero interest rates. <laughs> he won't because touch it. Because they know what happens when debt inflates assets. And we're seeing it in the stock market. You know, look, I was on with Koshi yesterday and they're saying, oh, what do you think of the value of this guy? Are you kidding me? There's no value in this company. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, there's a stock called Afterpay. Everybody's chasing Afterpay, especially the millennials out there. Mm, mm. They're chasing Afterpay because it's like quick money. You know, Afterpay went from $8 at the low. It fell from $40 in March, uh, February, March, to that low of $8. And then they just hit a record high of $62 a week ago from $8. Mm. Wow. And that's... it. That's a company that cashes in on, on indebtedness. Well, pay, buy now, pay later. Yep. It's like a lay-by system. Do you know how much profit Afterpay makes, you know, the valuation of the company? I ask these people, especially someone comes up to me as a millennial, they don't know anything about, like me, when I was in my early 30s, when I was saying, I had no idea, late 20s, early 30s, I had no idea what I was, I mean, I'm an accountant, right? I can value, I can look at balance sheets. And now I know about valuation, that's for sure. But, you know, if somebody comes up to me, I say, do you know the value of Afterpay, the market value of this company based on their share price? And nine times out of ten, no one, they haven't got a clue. Well, it's $15 billion. Now, to put that in perspective, that's worth more than Qantas. It's more worth more than QBE Insurance or Suncorp. These companies make, like QBE makes a billion dollars profit. So what does... After pay makers a profit for the half year, they never have made a profit. They've had a loss. So okay. how is that possible? Because everybody loves the story. Yeah, but as Landmark says. But it's, uh, it's incredible, though, that, 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 um, that just ties into all the times that there's, there's been a run on this or a run on that, like a run on cryptocurrencies and, and you know, like people just rushing like, like a mad herd. It, that's... It, you just hit the nail on the head, George. It's the herd mentality. If you watch Notice Nature programs, you know when you watch the herd running and suddenly they get scared and run the other? That's the stock market. Yeah, well, it's actually a bit like the when we had the bushfires here around the around Christmas time. There was a lot of talk and then there was this, um, you know, this well-meaning celebrity, Celeste, set up this charity and, and she's... And she had everyone around the world enrolled in this um, supporting people who were victims of the fire cause. But unfortunately, she had it all going into a trust account, which was nobody could touch it. So it's not getting used for the benefit of the people that got affected by the fires, which was obviously everybody's commitment for, for donating to that. But that's where the herd mentality, we've got to stop and have a look at what we're really up to here before we just go throwing money into something because everyone else is doing it. And um, yeah, look, this can happen with policy as well, I'm sure. It's funny, I just led a course on the weekend to a very small group these days. It's only, you know, small groups of people who run a two-day program called, you know, whether you have any knowledge about the market or none whatsoever, it's better if you know nothing. And <laughs> they were blown away because I show a lot of charts, you know, I show trends. You've got to understand trends and timing. Timing, look, I can analyse a business. That's easy for me in two minutes, you know. But... Knowing when to buy and when to sell is the key. Most importantly, when to sell, when to exit. 
most people do not have an exit strategy, whether it be in business mm -hmm. or property or shares. Yeah. When I was on Your Money, Your Call, 95%, there's this magic number that Robert Kiyosaki always used, the 95% who are the herd. When they ring me up on Sky Business, they'll just ask me about a stock, right? And it's gone, it's gone, it's gone down. My first question is, well, what was your exit strategy? Well, what do you reckon the response is? Didn't have one. Didn't have one. Not like, now, not only didn't they have one, they probably didn't even know where you'd have one. So, so to me, timing is everything in any investment, whether it be stocks, property, or bonds timing when to get in and when to get out and the thing so getting back to your original question george sorry i went off on a tan tangent there i haven't forgotten your question okay what did i learn i learned how to how to become a a good risk manager yeah how to yeah. manage risk yeah how to prepare for any downside there's um you know there there was um templeton funds um uh, Sir John Templeton, who passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 95, Global Fund, the Templeton Group, right? Very wise, humble man. He said this. He said, the most dangerous words that an investor, any investor can say to his or herself, whether it be in property, shares or business, is that will never happen. <laughs> but what if? Mm. But what if? What are you going to do if it happens? That's the biggest, that's the most important question. But the people go, oh, that'll never happen. No. They go, but what if? Well, well no one that's... predicted, no one predicted um, COVID-19. And, um, and what, what it threw up for me, David, was that how our, um, our, the, the fabric of our economy and all our financial institutions, uh, like a house of cards, um, there, there's, there's very little substance behind it. And, um, and it got pretty shaky, hence the reason why the government knew it had to get, get in there and, and start pumping money into the economy. But we've created this, this, this global, global community or structure that, that, that can't really survive on its own and can't really react to any local, local changes without crumbling. Like, really? Like, I mean, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Well, <laughs> that's a great question, George. Uh, I've got some thoughts on the matter, but like you said, it's the blind leading the blind, you know, mm. and and it's only crisis by management. See, this is the thing that um, the central banks have been doing. Look, and they fear the worst. If they don't uh, put up, you know, support the markets, the financial markets, the, 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 the fear is we're going to go into a global deflationary depression and they're just not willing to take that risk. There are other ways to, you know, get out of this mess, but printing more money is certainly not the way, ultimately, and borrowing more money. And like what Trump's doing, you know, spending more, Congress approving, you know, the trillion and a half fiscal deficit. I mean, geez, please. I mean, how are they going to pay that back, you know? Um, anyway, look, I, I recommend to any of the viewers out there, listeners, I should say, not viewer, listeners. I don't know if this is podcast. We've got both. We're going to have viewers and listeners. <laughs> I recommend they go and listen to people like Stanley Druckenmiller. He did a talk you can find on YouTube, Stanley Druckenmiller, who used to be, like I said, he was the legendary hedge fund manager. He managed, um, he was the right-hand man for George Soros, the quantum mm -hmm. fund. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy's one of the most respected uh, money managers in the world. And he was uh, asked to speak. Um, he did a talk at the New York Economics Club. Uh, recently, um, he did a talk. So if you, if you Google his name at the New York Economics, he did an excellent interview. It was during the COVID crisis via uh, Zoom or YouTube. And he'll pretty much give you the, the you know, summation of, what's going on here, you know. Right. That, so, um, look, my, uh, I, I'm not licensed to give people specific financial advice. I ed, I'm an educator, but here's what I say to people. I would not be in debt. I would just be here for an excessive amount of debt, you know. You just don't want to be at that. And wealthy people hate being, like extremely wealthy people hate debt. 
They, yeah. they, they like to have cash and bonds and, you know, but I would just be worried about being too much leveraged in debt. It'd be my number one message that I would warn people about, whether it be in stocks or shares. Oh, sorry, or property. I mean. Well, one, one of the things we've noticed over the last three months, David, with COVID coming along is the, the transaction volumes in real estate, for instance, has, has gone, went down significantly. Um, maybe the volume went down about 80%. And this is part of the reason why, why we set up the Osway platform for agents is around, um, you know, basically the way that they get remunerated, they're, they're earning two to three times or they're, they're profiting two to three times the amount on a, I guess the way that the traditional real estate models are, are run out there in real estate. And it's like an insurance bet. It's a risk bet. Um, you know, you, you need somebody to take care of your back of house, but if the volumes do go down and they're going to get better again at the moment, but if they come back off again, it's hedging your bets. It's having something in place to go, you know what? I can still feed my family. I can still take care of myself if that does yeah. happen. And um, yeah. what, what, are the, what are the things people can put in place around from what you share and what you teach people with around how to, how to, how to prepare themselves other than getting out of debt or, 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 or you know, reducing debt as much as they can? What, what's some proactive things apart from that that they can do to, I guess, hedge against you know, these sort of things happening? Well, um, you know, this is where you can use um, derivatives or options to make money in the stock market when it goes down, let alone go up, where you, right. don't, have to invest, you don't have to invest a lot of money to make a lot. Like, I can buy an option just to give it a, a, some idea what I mean, that'll cost me $2,000. That's my maximum cost or risk. Um, that'll give me leverage to buy $40,000 worth of shares or up to $100,000 worth of shares. You know, like um, wow. the other day. How does that work? How does that work? Well, it's, it's, that's what's called derivatives. It, it gives you the right, like there's two types of options. There's a call option and a pull up, put option. So if you buy a call option, it gives you the right to buy the shares at a specific price by a specific time. So the thing with options, there's, there's a limited time period. You can, you, know, one, you can go out to one month, two months, three months, six months, 12 months, two years if you want, or even longer. But most people in Australia, you know, you're, you're, you're buying options between one and three months, okay? So it's short-term, short-term trading. The share price doesn't have to move much for you to make a lot of money on that option. All in right. fact, you don't hold the option till expiry. You never do. You just buy and sell it within a few days or a week. So, um, and I, I've got lots of examples of this. That's what I mostly do. So you're not using a lot of cash. Right. Now, there's also shares that I buy in businesses or companies that are generating really strong cash flows, like the gold sector right now. That, that sector, there's a lot of businesses generating a lot of cash flow. It's getting a bit expensive now. But there's other areas that I look at. When I look at a business, I look at what's their financial health? How much debt do they have? Or how much cash, more importantly, do they have? How much cash flow they're generating? What sector or industry are they in? What's the outlook for that industry or sector? Like right now, the hot potato is buy, buy now, pay later. <laughs> you know, <laughs> after pay, zip money, um, you fear it. There's all these other, you know, hot areas that people are buying, but they're not making... Yeah, they're generating a huge amount of revenue and clients, you know, customers that are escalating. And that's what people love is the amount of people using this service. But the bottom line is, show me the money and there's none. Can, can people use, there, are you able to do this for people, David? If, if, if I said, hey, I've got, I've got some money here and I, I just want you to do what you're doing. Is that something you're able to do? I don't, I don't, I run a small fund, but I don't go out there and need, you know, asking for money to manage. That's just, I'm not a fund, something or something I really want to do. You know, uh -huh. I, I do, I do run a small fund for a small close group of uh, clients and friends. Uh -huh. um, but I, I, you know, I don't need the headache really. I can, I can just manage and, I, and it's easier for me getting in and out of the market. These funds that are industry funds, super funds, they're managing billions. It's not easy for them to get in and out. Mm. But so you're, you're more in the, in, the, in the education space then with WealthWise Education, it's more about educating people on how to, how to be responsible around and understand what yeah. there is, what the options are. And my rules for investing mm. or trading, whatever you want to be, an investor or trader, the rules. It's like people run out. It's like, would you go 
and play? Like, what what game do you play? What's any sports that you guys play? Like any? Oh, I used to play rugby union. Rugby, <laughs> rugby, rugby union, rugby league. Okay, now imagine. Yeah, I, I love rugby union, rugby league. Imagine running out on the field and not knowing the rules, <laughs> and then someone passes you the ball, and you get tackled, and you and then taken off a, on a stretcher. Mm. That's what happens to people in the stock market. They're going in, playing this game, and they have no idea what they're doing, just like I did back in the 80s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because they usually... And they get cranked. Because they get in, they get in. Uh, look, I, I had this, I think, I think I shared this with you a while ago, David. I, I had this uh, very uh, old, successful businessman in, in the early days when I was working in a restaurant behind a bar and he said to me, uh, son, uh, life is very simple. He was a, a Hungarian fellow. It is. Uh, he said, it's very simple when you go to uh, dinner and, uh, you know, everyone talks about property, sell your properties. <laughs> when, 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 when they're all talking about making money on the share market, sell your shares. <laughs> sell. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. When the taxi driver says that you should yeah, be yeah, investing well, he's, in property, he's, he's, get out. It's time to get out. <laughs> Matt, talk yeah. about, talk about, talk about uh, like, uh, okay, so we're talking about, you know, people doing things like that. And that's a, that's a herd mentality that, that a lot of people um, can't help themselves to, to uh, be affected by. But then we also have, like in, the, like in the real estate game, a lot of flash, but no cash. A lot, a lot of people living off credit, flash. Asset rich, cash flow poor. Yeah, cash, cash flow poor. So the moment the market contracts a little bit, they're in a, they're in a whole world of hurt. So yeah. you're, not, you're, not just, you're not just teaching people to like, play games of the rule, um, uh, rules of the game in the finance market. I think you're also going well beyond that and teaching, like, you must be touching on their lifestyle and how they're behaving in that area as well. Would you like to share a little bit about that? Totally. Well, it's called a financial wisdom program that we could put together uh, one day based on, you know, look, as I said, I was a high school dropout at the age of 15. My parents were immigrants to this country. We're talking about this, George, you know, same time as your parents. Yeah. In fact, you know, your parents had that milk bar across the road oh, from the school I went oh, to. And I, suspect if, and I suspect if I dig deeper, we're actually cousins. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they were hard workers, you know? Yeah. My yeah. father was a painter, you know? He, he, he was a painter. That's what he did and painted houses and not like a landscape painter or anything like that. But, yeah, he's a hard worker. My mother my mother worked in hospitals at catering um, um, a staff person and you know cleaner i mean they're hard workers and um but the problem is they didn't understand about money my mother's philosophy was you know you work hard and you save the money and then you'll buy a property now my father's philosophy was the total opposite that's why their marriage didn't last mm. which was to make it fast you know you you work hard but you get the money and you then go and try and make it on the horses <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. that's why their marriage didn't work he was a uh, fast you know make it fast spend. and you know the funny thing is my father used to and i appreciate you appreciate this after i did the when i did the landmark forum you know you discover these beliefs that you're brought up with and one of the things i discovered about one of the beliefs this is all around money financial wisdom okay you got to look at the beliefs what are the beliefs that your parents had? That's where you start with. What did they tell you about money? So that was my parents' philosophy. But here's the thing my father always complained about, was about my mother. She said, if your mother listened to me, I'd be a very rich man. <laughs> it was the opposite. We lived in Surrey Hills, and my mother said, wait, why don't we buy this property here and you'll fix it because it's good with money, you know? And then <laughs> we... We then rent and then we buy enough. We would have owned half of Surrey Hills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, it sounds like your mum was playing the long, your mum was playing the long game and your dad was playing the short game. That's it. The, mm. That's right. So I had this paradox, you know, it was a paradox. Uh, and school, who teaches you about money at school? No one. No one. No. So I had to go and discover this myself, the rules. And that's why, 
That's why Rich Dad, look, it's, it's no coincidence that I met Robert Kiyosaki. His very first book was, if you want to be rich and happy, don't go to school. That was before Rich Dad came out. And I picked up that book and I had one of those premonitions, I'm going to meet this guy. That's why he loved about my story. And that's what I was passionate about with Rich Dad was, you know, take it globally, to bring financial, financial literacy to the world, to mm. schools. Because where else are you going to get it? Unfortunately, that's another story with Robert I won't go into. I, I suggest that he go public, you know, raise a billion dollars and bring open up Rich Dad schools around the world. And I would have been happy to be one of the key trainers. But he wanted to be in control. That was his limitation. He wanted to keep control and not see, like, you know, the self-expression leadership program that is very powerful. That now It's about giving it away, expanding yourself. He would have been a multi, multi-billionaire. So I'd say he's still incomplete with his dad. <laughs> That's what the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad is all about. You know, so you're just, you're on mute. Okay, I was I was saying which which dad though he had two so that's we, right which is he complete with he's poor, well the poor dad yeah I'd say the poor dad yeah which was the the you know his dad was a teacher was a I think as a um a, a university lecturer or that's something. right yes yeah. he was he was in the academia yep and, and, and the poor mindset and, his, and okay. his friend he was brought up in a wine his friend was the one that had the rich dad yeah but it's it, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, so so the, here's the thing, right? I, I I now live in Darlinghurst, and Darlinghurst is a, a very different to how it was when I was a kid, right? We had we had working class people who truly believed in, certainly the women believed in squirrel, squir, squirreling away as much money as you could, and the husbands, a lot of the husbands believed in spending it on drink and and horses, and you know that that was quite common. That was quite common, but but even today, it's it's kind of like the same outcomes, even though it looks different. We've got, you know, we've got expensive terrace houses, uh, you know, a, a couple, a couple, uh, uh, you know, like young families where, where they have two very expensive yeah. cars, kids yeah. go to private schools and yeah. this, this, this insistence on living above your means, yeah. way beyond your means, no different to taking it down to the, the races and, and putting it on horse number 11, you know, That's and, right. And why are they doing that? They're doing that so that their friends or people they don't even know think that they're doing well and think that they're doing okay. Well, what's the point of people thinking you're doing okay if you're really not doing okay? That I don't it's get all, it. It's all about looking good. As you right. Know. right. It's and all about you, looking good. Do you, have to, do you have to coach a lot of people, um, um, David, in the in, in this space that you're in about that? Because whatever they make with you in the share market would, would, would just disappear really in other areas very quickly. Well, that's not what you do. That, no, no, George, you've got a very, that's a very good point. But look, that's the whole, that's why I'm a seminar leader for Landmark. Because that's all to deal, deal with your, your way of being and thinking, you know, the blind mm. spot. Mm. It, it look. Here's the bottom. It's easy to make money. It's easy to make money, especially in the stock market. It's easy to make it. It's hard to keep it for most people not spend it because yep. of their psychology. 98% is psychology. There's the herd mentality. I'm seeing it right now. This is, the, this is history repeating itself, what's going on out there. And human beings, we just don't learn from the past. We just keep making the same mistakes. And that's what's happening right now. And they're going to learn the mistake that, you know, this is just another bubble that's going on. So, you know, um, you got to keep yourself, it's like anything, to be good in anything. Like, what are you guys, what are you really good at? Are you good in anything in particular? Like, you know, to be masterful, to be masterful. In yeah, anything. yes. Whether it be sports or... Well, it'd be negotiation. I mean, one of the things that, 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 you know, as a real estate agent, you have to be a master in negotiation and um, working with customers and, and really being able, to, being able to deal with all different types of people uh, yeah. and, and whatever reactions they can have because they all have all sorts of different emotional reactions to things that go on and, and yeah. we have to be masterful at dealing with that and, and, and supporting them in, with whatever they need. Yeah, so it's like anything, like exactly like that. And now how many years does it take to become masterful? Like if you're a musician or a they say painter. It's they say it's 10,000 hours, right? You have to That's do right. 10,000 hours to become a master of something. 
So, you know, it's it's like, you know, training yourself at the gym if you want to get fit or, you know, it's like your mindset, you know. It's, mm. you know, people don't train their mindset. Um, that's why I'm, I love Landmark programs because it's always training you in your mindset and being present, or they say present into opportunities and possibilities, I should say, mm. you know. And when you're not, you got that little voice in the back of your head telling you what you can and can't do, and telling and driving you, you know, mm. taking you down that road that you don't want to go because you, you're not present to that little well, they're, voice. They're very different, those programs, David. I've done before I discovered Landmark about almost two and a half years ago now. I'd done every seminar or Tony Robbins event. I've been to all these different trainers and coaches and mentors, and I, I, I've estimated around, I spent about $200,000 on doing programs with people over the last 20 years of my life. These landmark programs are very, very different. They're not just uh, going in and getting information and writing down notes and trying to memorize everything. Actually, there's no notebooks and there's no memorizing stuff, and it's actually being present. Sometimes, you know, for many people, it's the first time in their life they're actually really present and hearing what's going on for them. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a, somebody described it as it's an ontological way of learning and discovering things, not just that, that, that uh, academia didn't work for me either. I didn't go too great at it. And a lot of real estate agents, I think, didn't do that great um, academically. And we learn more from being in the moment and, and making mistakes and discovering. And you know, that's those, those programs uh, and what we've discovered so far. And um, yeah, it's amazing what work you've done that, what you do there, David, and, and, and freely giving of your time to, to make a difference from others, but that those programs are so powerful, and um, oh, they are. But yeah. let's talk. Let's talk about. I mean, the, I mean, obviously, mindset is very important when 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 you're approaching the market. Critical. 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 But but we're talking about we're talking about um, um, an access to to power, uh, being powerful in life and, 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 and being productive and, and getting the results that, that you want. And this is, this is, this is an area that, you know, people come up against all the time. They, they feel like they're powerless. They don't feel Everybody. like everybody. Yep. And, and agents know less, particularly when, when the edifice of, of the economy seems to be collapsing around them, they, they, they must be up against it even more so. Right. And, uh, and these are the kind of um, breakthroughs that everyone really needs, particularly when when the going gets tough. But but you know your message your message from what I heard was that there's money to be made, no matter whether the market's going up or whether it's going down. Correct. And most people, ninety five percent that you know, number are going, only make money when the market's going up and put the money into industry super funds or fund yep. managers that just get their fees regardless of whether they perform or not. Yep. And I did, I did this study around the world, you know, as I said, in front of a hundred thousand people over five years. So the question I asked in front of a thousand people or more always is this, you know, how many people have got investment in uh, re- some form of retirement savings or superannuation here or 401k in the U S and you know, all these hands go up and I, I say, leave your hands up if you know what the average return has been on your super fund or, you know, retirement fund over the last three years or average last three years. Most hands go down, at least 90%. Okay, the ones that have still got your hands up, keep your hands up if you know where the money is invested, how it's allocated. Hmm. Well, there'll be 2% if that of the whole room. Now, I said, this is your retirement savings plan. You have no idea if you're making money and let alone know where the money is being invested. There's my point about the lack of financial literacy in the world. Mm. So when you leave school, what do they give you? Hey, come and get your first credit card. You know? Buy this doodad, this nice car. It's called a doodad that, uh, that again, rich dad calls, you know? Yeah, people and say how flashed so, you look so, and how Robert, successful you look. Yeah, so comes back to, as Robert defines an asset, an asset is what puts money in your pocket. Very simple analogy, right? And, and that's why rich dad sold so many books. It's very simple. And so then I say, is your car an asset? No, okay. Is your house an asset? 
Ah, depends. Is it putting money in your pocket or taking money out of your pocket? You know, are your shares an asset? Well, are they paying you a dividend? Just see what I mean? Yeah. So really simple, simple teachings that they don't teach you at school. And it's just okay to go and borrow and then spend or what, you know, and then you end up with credit card. And now, now that's why buy here, buy now, pay later is so popular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, can I, can, I, can I just ask for those people who haven't, um, well, they didn't bother to become financially literate. They just repeated patterns since the age of 17, 18, and they're now in their 50s. Yeah. Um, is it too late? No, it's never too late. Uh, right. You know, the, it, it's never too late. The, the thing is, this is why, um, you know, we teach people, I mean, look, when you're younger and you're, you've got time on your side and, you know, it's the law of the compound interest, you know, as Einstein said, the most powerful law, when you can start young and save, become a good saver is what I learned from my mother. And that's for a lot of people like, you know, I met a lot of, a lot of wealthy people. I met billionaires, you know, I tell you, they're, they're, you'd be surprised, they're risk adverse. I mean, there is risk that you take in life, right? There are initially risks. Mm. But as you get older, you want to become more risk adverse. And, or you want to be, you know, as I said, learn how to be a good risk manager, how to manage risk and take the emotions away from investing. Because when you can allow for the downside risk, you know, you know what the potential upside could be. You know, but more importantly, you know what the downside is. You can manage that and you know it's not going to send you broke. Mm -hmm. So... Again, it comes back to when you're younger, you've got time on your side and when you can save and invest, you've got that compounding factor. Now, I started doing that when I left school. And like I said, I was financially independent in my late 20s. Like, I had I had my own property. I was the financial controller of a $6 billion bank. And, but there was something missing. I was bought. Mm. I thought, is this it? Mm. So yeah. then I was, I guess what I discovered in the forum, you know, the, you discover these blind spots. Are you ready for this? This is what mm -hmm. blew me away. Because if you said to me, I was going to talk to my dad again after he left, I was like never in, you know, it was 15 years after he left by the time I did the forum and I'd never spoken to him. And this is what I discovered in the forum. I went from being like my mother, a good saver, conservative, brought my house, bought my own house, paid it off everything. And then became totally reckless and became like my dad, a gambler in the stock market. Wow. So the very thing that I hated about my dad is what I discovered I became. Wow. That was wow. When, can you imagine getting that in the, yep. in the three day program? So it was, wow. you know, I, I reconnected with my father, forgave him, you know, for what happened in the past and everything and, and was compassionate about what he must have gone through. That was, you wonder why I'm a seminar leader for Landmark. Yeah, well, I can also get why his point of view was, you know, he, he's, he's, got, he's got a point of view because of what, how his parents brought him up probably and what he was exposed to and uh, that's what he got from it. Exactly. We don't, you just don't know what that was for him, but there's no right or wrong about it. It's just that just is what it is. That's that's right. So you see what I mean about understanding, you know, about money, about your, from your parents and how you're brought mm. up, and that I got to tell you that shocked me. That blew me away. And there's like like I said, I I I had compassion for my father after that from being someone who was angry and resentful towards my father. To someone being well, compassionate towards him. Well, I'm actually getting a lot. I'm getting from this yeah. conversation, David, is how important, like how we. I, I've I've actually grew up thinking what my idea of healthy was in terms of what food is healthy based on what my parents gave me. That's what I determined what healthy was, and uh, money wise, how I live my life. Again, how my parents taught me, and how I run a business was based on what I learned from what I watched from my parents. And and it wasn't until I started yeah. going out and discovering real experts and not there's plenty of people out there that want to sell you uh, courses and things like that 
that don't really have the experience and, you know, they may have watched somebody else, but they haven't actually done it for themselves. There's a lot of that going on out there. But to find mentors and advisors who have who are experts saying if it's if it's health that you want to go after, you want to have a really healthy body, you've got to find them. If it's money, you find somebody around money. If it's investing in the share market with options like you've got a company called Well is it it's Wealthwise Education, David? Yeah. Wealthwise Education. Wealthwise and whatever education. area it is, find somebody. Our parents just because our parents didn't know how to do something, it doesn't make them bad parents. They've all done the best they can and they've done the very best job That's they right. could for us. But, but that doesn't mean it's their job to, to be our mentor around money, you know, relationships, um, healthy foods and all the rest of it. I mean, some of them may give great advice and be excellent mentors, but, but for the vast majority, if you're saying that only like a handful of people, 2% of people in a room knew where their money was, I'm going to assume there's probably only 2% of people's parents who are going to be an expert in one particular area or another, whether that's relationships, money um, or health or what have you. Yeah, and of course, money is not the most important thing. It's all a balance. You know, relationships to me and your health, they're the most important thing. You know, and yeah. money, it's all important, you know. Absolutely. If you don't make it the, 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 well, some people do make it the most important thing, you know, but they trash their relationships as a result, you know what I mean? So, or again, their health, or their health, all, their health gets, a, gets a workout and, uh, you know, they end up having bad health issues. And that's not, what's the point of being the mm. richest man in the grave? Mm, mm. Well, you know, that's right. You but know. I did I did meet a trader once who, who did say money can't buy you love, but it gets you damn close. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, so, and, so, is that how you feel? And, and, and you can be, and you can be comfortably miserable. <laughs> if, Absolutely, if you're on your own. You know what I mean. Look, look, you know, no, but also I also met another person who once told me very wise words. He, he told me that money simply magnifies who you are as a human being. And, um, yeah. you know, and, and that's, uh, it, wouldn't it be lovely to, to ha I mean, for everyone who wants to do good for others, to have the money yeah. and the financial wherewithal to be able to, to be able to, you know, fulfill their dreams. Yeah. Because you want to make a difference. Look, everybody wants to make a eventually wants to make a difference to their, their family, their friends, their community, society, or the world. You know, um, and uh, yeah, look at that's what it's all about. That's what gives you the greatest. That's what I've discovered. I should say has for me gives me the greatest satisfaction and pleasure mm. is being able to share what I've learned and all the mistakes I've made, and I've had a few to share with the world and say, listen, you don't have to go down this tunnel. I've been there. There's no cheese down there. <laughs> There's none. Don't go down this tunnel. There is a lot easier way to go. Now, of course, like I said, when people find discover the rules for investing, which are simple, then you've got to manage greed. That's the one of the biggest factors and fear. Greed. Well, have you seen have you seen those those emotions take hold of people um, before your very eyes? Have you seen people just transition into these Frankenstein's? Oh, totally. Totally. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Well, I can. You know, look. Would you I'm like to share a story? <laughs> yeah. Look, I had one guy. You know, he's um, he was making you know about a million dollars a year trading mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on derivatives and options, but he was taking excessive amount of risks. And I told him, look, uh, uh, look, I could go so deep into this, right? And I was mm -hmm. telling him, I was, um, you know, I was running a mentoring program. I don't do it anymore. I thought, no, I'm not doing this anymore. But I was literally like telling him, he, he's a client of mine. He's done all my training. You know, I've got a curriculum of courses and he was what I'm going to call one of my super traders, right? Come on. And we'd go away to every year to Bali or when you went to New York where we just trade, you know? That's some of the things we do. And so he's experienced, but here's the thing. He became very reckless and he was gambling and making a lot of money. But I told him, you know, have you ever played Russian roulette or seen that movie, The Deer Hunter, mm. where he points the gun like that and he's clicking the thing? You're doing that. It's only a matter of time. I said, look, and I said to him, he was into endurance sports and stuff as well. Like he was really driven. You know what I mean? He's a very, he had a very successful business in Dunnies, would you believe? Dunny, you know, portable <laughs> Dunnies? Definitely. <laughs> Okay. Well, that, they go together, don't they? But this guy, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's 
like, but this guy was so driven. I mean, it couldn't. And you know, there's another reason I told him to go and do the forum because I could see what was, you know, there's something behind, you know. And he was just one of the. He basically was very competitive, and he wanted to be better than me. <laughs> okay, yeah. I could see that. I, that was a blind spot for him because he had to prove himself. Guess who he ultimately had to prove himself to? Yeah, he got the lesson himself, didn't he? Well, ultimately, he couldn't see it. The blind spot was he had to prove himself to his dad that he couldn't see. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And he's so driven yeah. to prove himself. And I could see that. That's a blind spot. But it doesn't make any difference me telling him that. It made no difference. So I thought, how can I... So I knew this guy, you know, he's an endurance athlete. You know, he's doing things like running up mountains and stuff. I said, look, if you and I, if I was a mountain climber and I, I was teaching you how to mount, and I've climbed mountains for 30 years and I've fallen off a few and I've broken a few bones, I nearly died a couple of times, you know, but I've climbed every kind of mountain. And I, we're halfway up the mountain and I turn to you and I say, listen, you don't have your safety harness on. If you slip and fall, you're going to die. What would you do? Cling to the rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what would you do? You'd put yeah. your safety harness on. Absolutely, you would. That's what I told him. Did he do it? No. It was not happened? coachable. Not coachable. That's right. Mm. It's a blind spot. Mm. A really important point, actually, how important it is in life to be coachable and, and allow other people to contribute to us, especially when there's these, not just your, the neighbor from down the road or whatever, but somebody you're paying to be your mentor. Yeah. Well, from that point on, I stopped being his mentor. Mm. Yep. Well, I can, I take, can I take his place? Can I take his place, David? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I think we'd have a few laughs somehow. I think, you know, <laughs> and I, and I'd, certainly, I'd certainly want you to hold my hand. And, <laughs> put the and harness on you? Put the harness on me, yeah. <laughs> you, probably, you, pro you probably have to put the nappies on me too for a poop. <laughs> There'd be a few times I'd be nervous. <laughs> but but it, 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 was, it, was, it was really funny. I had this small group of people, and by the end of the course, I mean, they loved it, of course, and they said, oh, God, we tried to convince our friends to come, and they wouldn't come, you know, because they, they, they didn't want to spend the money and, you know, all the time, right? But the money, right? And they, don't, they said they don't need it. You know the old, I don't need it? No, it happens all the time. I said, well, I said, now... I said, you can see what they've been doing. They're gambling. They don't know what they're doing. They're gambling. Yeah. And they're making, you know, they make 10 grand, lose three grand, lose five, you know, it's like up and down like this. Yeah. I said, I've well, always... I, I, one of the best sayings I love is if, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> well, I, well, <laughs> Yes, it's very expensive on the uh, on the practical side of life, but at least you don't buy as many books. <laughs> you, save, you save some money there. It's like uh, you know, I, I once had I once had this person walk into my. So I I read a lot, David. I've probably given away way more than I've retained, but but I had this place at work that where I set it up, and it was a floor to ceiling book bookshelves, and people would come in, and and this one guy, I remember this one guy coming in saying, he looked around, he went. Oh, mate, mate, did you read all these books? <laughs> and I said, I said, no, no, I just bought them from the secondhand bookshop and I just put, I just put them there. He said, yeah, you know, I've never read a book in my life. And he was proud of it. He was proud of it, right? So he's proud of his and, – and that attitude of people saying, yeah, mate, I'm all right, I'm all right, you know. They, you know nothing wrong with me. Nothing wrong – they only – like in terms of what – what you can know in this world, they probably know like a, like a, a, a very small slither. Like my father, my father, I can only imagine how, how life was. Could you imagine how hard it, 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 it was for a person, or it is for a person who, where English is not their first language. They never went to school and they never read a book. Mm. And they're trying well, to come apparently. up. And, they, and Yes, and they're trying to come up with solutions in life. Uh, yeah. yeah it's it's challenging the I, I, I must say though george i think the, the the people that are the happiest must be the happiest out there are the people who who don't know anything and they don't even know that they don't know anything they're just like in bliss 
I mean, when you start to read a book, I remember reading my first couple of books and you read a book and all of a sudden you go, my God, there's so much that I don't know. Am I really prepared to go on this journey? And it's uh, it's a journey, right? It's life mm-hmm. is a journey. It's not mm-hmm. about a destination. And um, the people that we meet, the books that we read, the stories that we can share with each other, just like this today. And, you know, having it's I'm so grateful, David, that you've uh, made the time to join us for today yeah. and um, yeah, sure. share your story and uh and it's 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 wonderful. It's an yeah. amazing story of, from where you've come from being a, 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 a um, timid accountant who who went to speaking on the world class stages all around the world with some of the world's largest trainers and, and mentors. So it's an incredible story. And you're yeah. still your passion for teaching is still there today. So if anybody who's listening yeah. wants to um, you know discover more about um, how they can you know be smart with their money. Um, you got Wealthwise Education. How? Where, where's the best place for them to get in touch with you? I just go to the website uh, wealthwiseeducation.com. You know, and you know, but the thank, thanks very much for that, Bo. Because you know, the thing I wanted to say, you know, is that it was the forum that I went into to, to discover what my passion is, and my passion is teaching and making a difference. That's what I'm really not just about making money and all this sort of stuff. It, or, you know, look at me, look at me. It's nothing about, or it's really, I'm just, you know, and everybody's got this passion, you know what I mean? So here's my, um, uh, I guess, hot tip, if you like, is, you know, discover who you are. What's your mm. self-expression? Mm. And that would light you up and make a difference. And this is who I am. You know, this is what I discovered mm. that I'm eternally grateful for what I got out mm. of the forum and why I love doing interviews like this, you know? And so thanks for the opportunity. Hmm. And, and, and having said that, David, you still do look pretty smooth on stage, mate. You do look good. <laughs> You're slick. He's, I love he's it. Still, he's, still laugh, he's still trying to manipulate you for some coaching, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you, is it written here on my forehead? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'll give Free you course. Some hot tips. I'll give you some, a couple of hot tips. <laughs> Stock tips. <laughs> oh, David, I really right. appreciate your time, us. David. Thank, thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, yeah. David. Thanks, George. Thanks, Barry. Yeah. Thanks, George. Thanks, 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 Thanks. 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 See you. Bye for now. Yeah. See you. Bye